a long story, but okay. test one, two, testing. You'll use it here, and I'll just tell Steve he'll have to pull it off of this. Okay. Or I'll get someone to do it for him. After you're done, and okay. you'll have plenty of time. Where's Eric? It's because of that. I'm going to move this a little bit. OK, you want some help? Thanks. It's just getting feedback from that speaker.
Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Ken Ferreira, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Student Financial Services here at Franklin Pierce, and I am uh, the member of President Mooney's senior leadership team with the distinct privilege of introducing you to our guest, uh, Steve Kornacki, this afternoon. To all of you here in Ringe, New Hampshire, and to those of you watching, via, watching us live via webcast from points around the world, welcome to Franklin Pierce University. We are privileged to have with us today Steve Kornacki, national political correspondent for NBC News and an MSNBC contributor and host. A film and television graduate from Boston University, Kornacki launched his political journalism career in New Jersey, where he spent three years reporting for politicsnj.com and then co-hosting a political news series at News 12 New Jersey. His byline can be found in DC's Roll Call, the New York Observer, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the New York Daily News, the New York Post, the Boston Globe, the Daily Beast, and Salon. Steve got his start at MSNBC as co-host of The Cycle and later took over, took over another MSNBC program up. In 2016, he was named host of a daily program from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. He also frequently guest hosts guest hosts on Hardball with Chris Matthews, All In with Chris Hayes, and The Rachel Maddow Show. MSNBC President Phil Griffin called Steve one of the network's breakout stars of the 2016 election, and he now brings his intelligent perspective and co to coverage of Washington, D.C. as NBC's national political correspondent. His specialty, he has said, is in the presidential primary process, so we welcome him to the Granite State, home of the first in the nation primary. Steve hails from nearby Groton, Massachusetts, which is where Jim O'Laughlin, who works in our Center for Academic Excellence, first met him. Jim is not with us here in Spagnola Hall today, but we do have a short video of Jim sharing some personal insights into the professional we know. happy to introduce our speaker for today, Steve Kornacki. Steve was an ex-student of mine back in Brunton Principal at the high school, and I've always known him as being a young man of integrity. He's maintained that same integrity as a uh, member of the MSNBC team. And I think his insights and what you'll see from, from this, uh, this uh, lecture today that he's going to give is going to be something very special. Having Steve on campus, I think, is, is a huge bonus and a plus for the community. So please welcome Steve Kornacki. Uh, I wish I was there with you, Steve. Uh, I plan to be uh, watching on Facebook Live as a student soon. Uh, I have the opportunity to be in uh, Dublin, Ireland at this time with my son on a, on a special event. So I'll be uh, probably in a nice little restaurant, maybe losing a toast, but I'll be watching live. So I'm there with you in spirit. Everybody, please welcome Steve Kornacki to Franklin Pierce. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. That was. Uh, I could be honest, if you would choose a, a pub in Dublin over this, too, I, I wouldn't be offended. I, <laughs> um, but that's, uh, that was really cool. Yeah, no, Mr. O'Loughlin was, um, uh, was my guidance counselor uh, back in high school, Grand Dunstable High School. Um, helped me, you know, get into college and, uh, and uh, kind of starting the path to today. And uh, Mr. Valacer was, uh, he's here, he's my uh, class advisor back in high school. Um, I was the, uh, give him a hand. He remembers my, my very, very brief foray into politics. I was the class president for one term before I was thrown out of office for, uh, uh, I ran up the cost of the prom, as I recall, and people didn't like that. So commentary is a little bit easier. You get to criticize and not take all the heat. Um, and um, Mrs. Franzine was another of my um, uh, high school teachers. Her, her husband is here today, her daughter. Um, she's no longer with us, but another, um, somebody who had a great, um, great influence on me and just it's great to see you guys here as well and um, and yeah no I, I, I grew up in this area uh, as you just heard in uh, in Groton Mass uh, it's my first time actually on campus here um, at Franklin Pierce so I picked uh, looks like I picked a perfect day to come up here this is uh, this is just beautiful so thank you to everybody for uh, for coming out for the hospitality and um, might as well get into it um, usually what I like to do with these is, is just sort of give you a little bit of a, a talk from my standpoint on, on the state of politics right now, kind of looking ahead to the next, um, the next election. 2018 is going to be the midterms next year. 2020, obviously, will be um, 
we assume, and we can't assume anything in politics these days, right? We don't know anything anymore, but um, we assume 2020 will be Donald Trump running for re-election and question of, um, you know, will the Republican Party be behind him from the, from the beginning? Will there be a fracture there? Will there be somebody who runs against him uh, in the Republican primaries? Um, Democrats, it, it, it looks like the most wide open race, the, the 2020 Democratic presidential race looks like you might have, I'm not even kidding, you might have 20 candidates um, step forward to run. There are um, you know, congressmen from Massachusetts, Seth Moulton, wasn't in office until about three years ago. Apparently he's looking at running. I mean, that's everybody who has a title, it seems, who's a Democrat is, is interested. And it's, I think it's, people just kind of look at Donald Trump and they say, you know, he could do it. Why can't I? Um, and it's just one of those examples, I think, if we could talk about this a little bit here, where I think Trump has the rise of Trump, his ability to win the Republican nomination last year and then to win the presidential election. The rise of Trump has really challenged and, and maybe just shattered, that might be the better word, just shattered some of the rules that we thought kind of existed um, in politics. Um, you know, for a long time there were, there was sort of like laws of gravity that uh, if you heard um, a political science professor or a commentator on television or a reporter, um, there, there were laws of gravity that we thought kind of applied to politics, laws of political gravity, and Trump basically defied them last year. I mean, there's, there's really no other way of, of getting around it. Um, and it poses a big question, looking ahead to that election in 2020, looking ahead um, to the midterms next year, um, and, and that is, will the normal laws of political gravity that we knew before Trump, will they reassert themselves? Do they still exist? Will they be operative in, a, in the climate of 2018 or t uh, 2020? Um, or have they changed for good? Or have they just changed for as long as Donald Trump is on the scene? A bunch of different possibilities there. So um, what I kind of plan to do here is I'll, I'll put a few numbers out there um, and, and just kind of give you my way of looking at it, then just open it up and, and you know, questions, comments, just love to hear from you guys um, for as much of this as I can. But um, from my standpoint, if we use next year's election, 2018 midterm election, so you've got, you know, Congress is up, the entire House of Representatives, so all, you know, 435 seats, uh, one third of the Senate, bunch of governor's races, you know, um, certainly in New England, basically every state's gonna be up next year in a governor's race. So you got a lot of elections next year. And it's a big question here, you know, Democrats are looking at this and they're saying Donald Trump's unpopular right now. I mean, if you take a poll, you ask Donald Trump's approval rating, you guys have probably seen it, it's not too good. Um, in fact, let me go over to the board and I can show you just by way of comparing, is this gonna, is my voice carry? Can everybody? Does that work? Ooh, okay. Hold it a little further away. So Trump's at 39% right now. That's his, that's his approval rating. And that's been pretty constant since he's been president. He's been in the low 40s, the high 30s. At his worst moment, he fell down to the low 30s. And so Democrats look at that, and I think a lot of, um, just a lot of political observers, analysts, pundits, they look at that and they say, oh, that, that's bad news. By any historical standard, that's a really bad place to be. Like, by comparison, I can show you. At this same point, when Barack Obama was president, right, his number was 59%, okay, and it came down eventually and he had a rough midterm election. When George W. Bush was president, his number was 56%. Uh, actually, this was right before, this 56% actually is from August of 2001. Then you had 9-11, September 2001, his number jumped up. So this is the last reading before 9-11. This is kind of the start that George W. Bush got off to. Um, Let's see here, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton actually had a rough start. He's the only one who even approaches Donald Trump's level. He was at 41%. George H.W. Bush, this early point, he was at 66%. And Ronald Reagan, back in the early 1980s, he was at 60%. So you see, all but Bill Clinton had just substantially higher approval ratings at this point um, compared to Donald Trump. And what did this mean, what did these approval ratings mean in the midterm elections for these, uh, for these presidents and for their parties. Well, Barack Obama, his actually fell over the course of the next year and a half. They passed 
Obamacare, the unemployment rate was rising. You remember there was the Great Recession and everything. Uh, and so when Barack Obama was president, his number, his approval rating fell over the next year and change, and Democrats lost control of Congress. Uh, George W. Bush's went up, 9-11, country kind of rallied around him. Um, the Republican Party actually gained seats. Bill Clinton, that's what we say is the closest comparison. Bill Clinton's midterm election, 1994, his first midterm election, is a disaster for Democrats. The Republican Revolution, the Republicans won back control of the House of Representatives for the first time in 40 years. Newt Gingrich became the Speaker of the House. People thought, before 1994, people thought that the, uh, the Congress was a permanent Democratic Congress. Well, Bill Clinton, two years of Bill Clinton, two years of a Democratic President, Democratic Congress in 1994, an approval rating like that, Democrats lost more than 50 seats, lost control of the House. They called it the Republican Revolution. Um, George H.W. Bush, his number was actually around that same point in the midterms. They lost seven seats. It wasn't much of a loss. It was, you know, pretty much things stayed the same. It, Reagan's number fell as well by the midterms because there was a, a spike in unemployment, a recession. Um, and again, with that, the Republicans lost a lot of seats in Reagan's midterms. So what you see is a couple things. You see that Donald Trump's start, the start he's off to in these first nine months or so as president, um, except for Clinton, this is one of the worst starts we've ever seen when you measure it by approval rating. And then when you take a look at where the approval rating for these people, for these presidents, ends up by the midterm election, about a year and a half, you know, two years into their first term, uh, it correlates really strongly, historically, with how the party does. If the president's approval rating is under 50%, if the president's approval rating is approaching 40%, that president's party usually loses a lot of seats in the midterm election. And if somehow the president's approval rating is, is pretty high, if it's 50%, 55%, 60%, higher than that, midterms don't go that badly for them. George W. Bush did very well you know, in 2002. His father didn't do that bad uh, in 1990. Um, so historically, if you look at this, Donald Trump sitting at 39% right now, and again, it, it hasn't budged. His entire presidency, the highest he's ever been at in this daily poll that they take, this Gallup daily poll, the highest he's ever been at is 46%. He is at 46% for one day at the end of his first week in office. So, you know, you talk about a new president, honeymoon effect, people some sort of, you know, sort of give him the benefit of the doubt. Well, that was Donald Trump's honeymoon. It got him up to 46% approval rating for one day as president. I mean, in the past, presidents have easily gone over 70% early on in their terms. Donald Trump, 46% for one day, sitting in the high 30s right now. So, if you look at this historically, Democrats are feeling very good about 2018. They're saying there's sort of a buyer's remorse nature to these midterm elections that, uh, you know, okay, we elect the president, maybe he doesn't quite live up to our expectations, uh, we're a little disappointed, we're going to vote for the other party in the midterm election sort of as a check on the president. That's how it usually has worked historically. If that happens uh, this time, you could see Democrats next year taking back the House of Representatives. They basically need two dozen seats. 435 seats in the House. Democrats need a net gain of 24, and they take back the House of Representatives next year, two dozen. That's very doable if the laws of gravity that we've, that we've kind of known in the past, if they still apply. Democrats could absolutely do that. The Senate, the Senate would be a little tougher for Democrats only because not every Senate seat is up next year, and the group, one-third of the Senate is up every two years. They're six-year terms, and so one-third of the chamber every two years. The collection of Senate seats uh, that are up next year actually favor the Republicans. They're, they're almost, just the way it works out, sort of a fluke of political history, um, the Democrats have had very good Senate elections, this class of senators. And, and what it means is that of the, uh, I think it's of the 33 seats that are up next year, Senate seats that are up next year, 24 of them are Democratic seats. Only nine of them uh, are Republican seats. So Democrats have to defend 24 seats and then they've got to somehow make gains in the nine that Republicans already hold. So mathematically, it's a tough challenge for Democrats in the Senate next year. Tough to say how that would work out. But again, the big thing for Democrats is they want to get the House of Representatives. They want to get Congress. That's a very doable goal. Historically, that's something that uh, if you look at approval rating like that, you say, well, that could happen. And what would Democrats do if they got back the House? I, I think there'd be two, two big things you'd see. Um, one would be sort of psychological. Uh, the Democratic Party right now, and, and I think Democrats in general, people on the left politically, um, they, they've been in shock since November. I, I think you guys 
I'm sure whether you are a Democrat or whether you know a Democrat, you've probably felt this yourselves or seen this in others. Um, there's been a, 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 a psychological shock among Democrats that this happened, that Donald Trump is the president of the United States. Um, they wake up and they, they're reminded of it and they turn on Twitter and it feels, it seems uh, that every day Democrats see that, think about that, and, and can't believe it happened. Well, if Democrats are able in 2018 to win back the House, if they're able to have a really good midterm election, I think psychologically that would be a very big boost to the Democrats. They would say, you know what, uh, it, it was an aberration. Donald Trump, you know, it, it took us by surprise. We didn't see it coming. We weren't ready for it. We weren't prepared maybe the way we should have been. But look, we got our act together the last two years. His approval rating's low. He's paying a price at the polls. Things are going back to normal. I think you see a lot of energy on the Democratic side. Obviously, they would then try to roll it into 2020 um, uh, and to try to take him out in the presidential election that year. But I think Democrats would feel, obviously, psychologically, there'd be a big change in the Democratic Party. The other thing is, with control of the House of Representatives, what would Democrats be in position to do, potentially? It, it, usually, you wouldn't be talking about this this early, but this is, a, this is a very different presidency. And the word impeachment comes to mind right away. You've got people out there already. You've got Democratic politicians out there already who are talking about impeaching Donald Trump, whether it's something that may come out of the investigation that Robert Mueller, the independent counsel, is, uh, is working on right now, whether it's something to do with his business dealings and, and potential conflicts of interest, whatever the grounds are. The Constitution leaves it kind of very open-ended when it comes to impeaching a president. It's high crimes and misdemeanors. And high crimes and misdemeanors is anything you say it is. You can, you can accuse the president. You can say the president is guilty of whatever it is you think he's guilty of. And then you could say, and that is a high crime and misdemeanor. Um, y there are no actual literal statutes that he has to violate. So it's, it is a political charge in a lot of ways. And I think it raises the possibility. Right now, Democrats... You know, you can have Democrats out there calling for impeachment. They don't have the votes. They don't control the House of Representatives. Um, if they do control the House of Representatives, I'd be very interested to see if there's a lot of pressure from the base of the Democratic Party to move on impeachment. Um, again, to actually remove him from office, that would take a two-thirds uh, supermajority in the Senate. I, I don't see how that would um, currently, how that, how that would happen. But I could certainly see Democrats moving on that front uh, if they got the House back. So I think those are the two things I look at for 2018. But that's if... If gravity, as we've known it, applies, the question with Trump, as I said at the front, is does gravity still apply? So let me throw a couple other numbers at you, and I jotted these down. Usually I, uh, I can remember these, but I, uh, it's been a while since I did this presentation. Let me see here. Here we go. This is a year ago. Here's some other numbers about Donald Trump. This was in the height of the uh, presidential campaign. So there was a poll taken. My uh, network did this, NBC News, and we asked during the fall campaign last year at one point, do you have a positive impression of Donald Trump? Just do you, as a person, as a candidate, do you have a favorable view of Donald Trump? Number that said they do, 27%. And I can tell you that was the lowest ever recorded in our poll for a presidential candidate. 27% said they had a positive view of the guy who at that point was one of the two major parties nominee for president. 27% had a positive uh, view. We asked Republicans, this is just Donald Trump's party. Republican voters went and voted for him in the primaries. He got the nomination. So we asked Republican voters across the country, we said, are you satisfied that Donald Trump is your party's nominee for president? Are you satisfied? Just Republicans. And the number that came back was 38%. And I can tell you, that was an all-time low for a candidate or a nominee of either party. Um, that level of, that incredibly, incredibly low level of satisfaction, um, by far the lowest we had seen. Um, we asked the question, do you consider Donald Trump's views to be in the mainstream or to be outside of the mainstream? His, his actual positions he was running on. 57%, 57% in the poll said they considered Donald Trump's views to be outside the mainstream, to be extreme. So you put these numbers together, and I mean, these are the three that I came up with. We had <coughs> all sorts of other polls that were taken about, is Donald Trump competent, competent to be president? Number would come back in the 30s. Is he qualified to be president? Number would come back in the 30s. Question after question about basic fitness for office, basic character as a leader, basic impression of Donald Trump as a person, highest negative scores we had ever seen 
for a candidate for president, ever. And there was a lot of talk about Hillary Clinton and, you know, say, well, Hillary Clinton was unpopular too. And, and it's true. Hillary Clinton's numbers last year were not great by any historical standard, but they were better than Trump's. On every single one of these key questions, Hillary Clinton's number was significantly better than Donald Trump's. And so that's why last year, among other things, that's one of the reasons there was such an expectation that Hillary Clinton would win in the end. We'd never seen a candidate for president who, there's no other way of putting this, if you just put the name Donald Trump in front of people last year before the election, we had never seen a candidate for president who was as disliked as Donald Trump turn around and win the election. And that's what happened. And, and you can do the math. I mean, if 27% if have a positive view of him and he gets elected president, and I know it was, you know, she, Hillary Clinton got more votes, but Donald Trump, uh, you know, got, you know, 46, 47% of the vote, got a majority of the electoral college. 27% have a positive view of him and he's getting 46 or 47% of the vote nationally. An awful lot of people voted for Donald Trump, even though they didn't like him. You know, if 57% uh, think his views are extreme, outside the mainstream, he picked up some of those voters. Um, if 68% think he's not competent, think he's not competent to be president, big chunk of those voters voted to make him president anyway. So when we say this idea of do the laws of political gravity apply anymore? Do they not apply to Donald Trump? That's where that starts to come in. Because on, these were supposed to be what we called threshold questions in politics. If you don't get a majority saying you're competent, if you don't have a large number of people saying you're qualified, these are threshold level, this is what we thought. These are threshold level questions. If you can't, can't clear that threshold as a candidate, you can't get elected president. And Donald Trump turned around and got elected president. And it's raised, I think, all sorts of possibilities about what exactly was going on there um, and whether it still applies. And, and I can tell you, one of the, what, what Democrats hope, when they look at everything I'm, I'm just talking about right now, what Democrats hope is the case, um, is that maybe in a way that wasn't quite picked up in polling, it had to do with Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton was just that much worse of a candidate than Democrats thought she would be. Um, she missed opportunities to campaign in places she should have campaigned. She missed opportunities to put messages out there that would have connected with the critical swing voters in a, in a handful of states. Um, whatever the exact charge you want to put on it, was it Hillary Clinton specific? Was it a case that Hillary Clinton on some level or some collection of levels was such an inadequate candidate to the country that they turned around and voted for somebody that they viewed this way? And if that's what it is, if Hillary Clinton was just that uniquely poor of a candidate, then that's good news for Democrats. Because that means they could nominate almost anybody else in 2020 and these numbers are gonna drag down Donald Trump. That means in 2018, these numbers are gonna drag down Donald Trump. But the question is, was it more? For instance, Hillary Clinton's low numbers. They were low last fall, but they weren't low when she got in the race. Uh, take you back a few years, do you guys remember this thing called Ready for Hillary? So 2013, 2014, Hillary Clinton finishes up as Secretary of State under Barack Obama for favorable ratings. So Trump, you know, 27. Hillary Clinton was up in the 60s. She'd been out of day-to-day -day politics. She'd been Secretary of State. She'd been all over the world, the face of American foreign policy. And she got pretty popular. Her favorable rating was up in the 60s. And Democrats knew, look, okay, if she gets in and she runs for president, people are going to start taking shots at her again. That number will come down. But Democrats didn't think it was going to come down as far as it did. That's what Ready for Hillary was all about. They thought Hillary Clinton, coming off four years as Barack Obama's Secretary of State, coming off all of the experience she had before that, they thought Hillary Clinton was going to be such a strong candidate that it was in their interest as a party in 2013 and 2014 to basically clear out the field for her. No competition, as much as they could avoid competition, no competition, get her the nomination, unite the party early, get her as much money as you can, she is our best ticket. That was the thinking uh, of Democrats in Washington in 2013 and 2014. That was the Ready for Hillary movement. And it largely worked. I mean, it, when she got in the race in 2015, nobody thought she was going to have any trouble winning the Democratic nomination. Her only major opponent was Bernie Sanders. And, and I know what we now kind of see Bernie, Bernie Sanders is obviously a major player um, in politics right now. He wasn't in the winter and uh, spring of 2015. The expectation back then, I remember the first poll that came out, had Hillary Clinton 60 points ahead of uh, Bernie Sanders. The, the expectation when Sanders got in the race was, yeah, you know, maybe he can get within 20 points of her in New Hampshire or 20 points of her in Iowa. 
you know, and then that's it. She'll roll over him and, you know, it'll be the, the, the most lopsided nomination race you've ever seen. Well, that didn't happen. Um, there was more discontent in the Democratic Party. Uh, maybe to do with Hillary Clinton, maybe to do with the issue Sanders was raising, probably to do with both, but there was more discontent uh, than we thought. And then the other thing that was happening was, from the minute Donald Trump got in the race, he was kind of pursuing a, a two-front war. He was going after the Republicans he was running against, and he was calling them names. He was calling, you know, Jeb Bush low-energy Jeb, and he was calling Ted Cruz Lion Ted, and, you know, he was making fun of Marco Rubio. He was doing all of that. He was also going after Hillary Clinton. He was going after Hillary Clinton in a way that no other major Republican, no Republican uh, or really no political figure with a platform the size of Donald Trump's had ever gone after Hillary Clinton, calling her crooked Hillary. They're chanting, lock her up uh, at the rallies. Uh, he's bringing up all the, the stuff from you know, Bill Clinton's past. And it raises the question, I think, uh, how much of Hillary Clinton's low scores, her low polling scores, are a function of running against Donald Trump, uh, are a function of running against the, the kind of candidate American politics had never seen before. Somebody who would cross one boundary after another. They're unofficial boundaries. There's, it, you know, the question was, you know, would he face a penalty for having lock her up chance at his rallies? Would he face a penalty from the voters uh, for calling her crooked Hillary and, and for saying some of the things he said? And in the free market of politics, he, in the end, he got elected president. In the end, you could argue he didn't. He got elected with these terrible numbers, but he still got elected. And I, I, I think one of the wild cards is you can look to 2020 and you can look to some of the candidates who might step up and run against Donald Trump. And you can even poll them right now. You could poll Elizabeth Warren against Donald Trump. You could poll Mark Cuban. Hey, maybe they're going to go, you know, Trump style uh, on the Democratic side. Mark Cuban could be the, the candidate for president. You could poll him against Trump. Um, and maybe they'd even do well right now. I've certainly seen polls with like an Elizabeth Warren doing well. But I'm not sure we know what the effect is of, of standing in the arena the, the media atmosphere we live in today for a year or a year and a half as the candidate running against Donald Trump. I don't know that we know what Joe Biden or Elizabeth Warren or, or any of these other candidates, Bernie Sanders for that matter, would look like to the American public after a year and a half of Donald Trump slinging the kind of attacks and the kind of insults at them that he slung at Hillary Clinton. I, I think it's one of those wild cards. Democrats, as I said, they would like to believe it was something specific about Hillary Clinton. Maybe it was. But maybe it's something specific about Donald Trump and the effect Donald Trump and his style of politics, which we've never really seen practiced before, um, the effect that that has on how people view not just Donald Trump, but Donald Trump's opponent. So it's some, uh, I think to sum this up, and then we can get to some questions here, I think, but to sum this up, um, I think from a standpoint of what I do, and I try to analyze, I try to understand this stuff, I try to make sense of it, I, I try to kind of see where it's going. I, I, I don't, you know, I don't ever claim to have the, you know, the crystal ball and I'm going to predict this election, I'm going to predict that election. I think anybody who claims they can do that is a fool. Um, but from the standpoint of, of just trying to analyze this and just trying to make sense of what's going on in our politics right now, um, the place I've landed in October of 2017 is I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think we're going to find out. I have a lot of questions. I've, I've posed some of the questions I have about our politics right now, and I think we're going to get some answers. We're going to get some answers in 2018. If the Democrats take back the House of Representatives, if they gain 35 seats next year, if they pick up a couple Senate seats, if they're winning governor's races, you know, all over the country, um, you know, in Massachusetts, Charlie Baker's a Republican. He looks very popular. He's got a Democrat who's going to run against him named Seti Warren. The expectation is uh, that Charlie Baker's going to win pretty easily. If that ends up a closer race than we expected, Maybe that says something about a backlash against Trump, you know, hurting even a popular Republican. If that's the kind of election year we have in 2018, I think it's going to tell us something. That's going to start to answer the question, some of the questions I'm posing here today. That's going to tell us that, at least when it comes to the midterm elections, that the normal laws of gravity still apply. That a president with a 39 or 41 or 38, whatever the number happens to be, with an approval rating at that level, is going to pay a political price. That president's party going to pay a political price on election day. I think it's a significant thing. Now, on the other hand, if we wake up next year, if Donald Trump goes into election day with a 39% approval rating and Democrats gain four House seats and lose seats in the Senate and Republicans are winning governor's races across the country, 
I think that also starts to get us to an answer to the question, although it might raise some more questions too, because that would be something we've never seen before. That would be on the level of what we saw in 2016, when we saw a presidential candidate get elected with numbers like this. If that presidential candidate can get elected, then turn around and govern with an approval rating sitting in the high 30s or low 40s, and then have his party turn around and not really pay a price in a midterm election, that'd be new. That would be new. And that would tell you that the effect of Trump and the effect of Trumpism, it's bigger, it's broader, it's deeper, and it's maybe longer term than we thought. So that would also start to answer questions for us. Uh, and then, of course, when you get past 2018, we'll look to 2020. And I think 2020, like I said, we will see if Donald Trump faces a challenge in a Republican primary. I know, you know, John Kasich, the governor of Ohio, who ran in uh, 2016, he's talking a little bit. He's making some sounds about running against Trump. Um, just from looking at how he did in 2016, I can't see right now how 2020 would go any differently for John Kasich than 2016 did, but we'll see. And, and we'll see if somebody else steps forward. There's other names that have been suggested. So there's a question there of uh, whether Donald Trump will face a challenge in the Republican primary. Um, certainly right now, I think just based on everything we've seen, if, if he did, I would, I, I would definitely make him the favorite to win that, uh, again, just as he was in 2016. Um, and then there's a question about the direction, you know, the Democratic Party wants to go. Um, the last time, you have to go back about 40 years to find this many potential candidates lining up to run for president. The last time, so I said maybe 20, 25 Democrats. I, I'm not kidding. There's a list right now. Here's a good stat. Since 1960, which is basically when the, more or less when the modern kind of, you know, presidential uh, election process started, when, when, you know, primary started being held a lot to, to nominate candidates instead of smoke-filled rooms at conventions. Since 1960, six Democratic members of the House of Representatives, in all of that time, six of them have run for president, the House of Representatives, you know, your local congressman. It's generally a low-profile office. Generally, it's considered, you know, that's a big leap to be a member of just a, a House member and then run for president. So six have done it since 1960. There are currently six in the last month who've been to Iowa or New Hampshire, which means they're looking at running. So you might have six Democratic House members, just House members, running for president in 2020 uh, after six in the 60 years before that. And that's just Democratic House members. The mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, has been mentioned. The mayor of New Orleans, Mitch Landrieu, he may be looking, he is looking at it. Um, all sorts of senators, all sorts of governors. You know, Deval Patrick, the former governor of Massachusetts, he may be looking at it. Um, and, and that's just the sort of conventional list. Then you get to the question again, this sort of why not me phenomenon with Donald Trump. If Donald Trump can go from the Celebrity Apprentice on NBC, if Donald Trump can go from all the personal baggage he had through the years and run for president and win, how many people out there with a biography at all like that are looking around and saying, well, if he can do it, so can I. I mentioned Mark Cuban, the guy who runs Starbucks, uh, Howard Schultz. He might be interested in it. He's, he started to make some noise. Um, there could be celebrities out there. People have mentioned, and this is a kind of name, you know, people have mentioned The Rock. Usually you would laugh at that, not after Donald Trump. Um, in Michigan right now, honest to God, we don't know if he's going to run, but if he does, the front runner probably for the Republican nomination for the U.S. Senate is Kid Rock. Kid Rock is making the idea of running for the U.S. Senate part of his tour right now, his, his concert tour. But he might actually do it. I, I, can't, I can't look at it now and laugh when you see what Donald Trump was able to pull off. So the Democrats will face a big question there, a, a very basic, big but basic directional question in 2020. Do you want to go with uh, what you would normally go with in the past? A, a well-accomplished senator, a governor, you know, somebody like that with a political resume? Or do you look outside the box? Do you fight fire with fire? Do you say, well, if they're going to put Donald Trump up, we got to put somebody up like Donald Trump, somebody from that world, somebody like Mark Cuban, somebody like Oprah Winfrey, something like that. So I think that is potentially something Democrats are going to face. But then again, when that all gets settled out, 2020 will then probably end up being a test of what we saw in 2016 with a twist. If, if, if this rate, Donald Trump's numbers are still low, Donald Trump's running for re-election, we're going to be asking the same question we did in 2016. Can you win with numbers that low? But we're going to be asking it with a twist because the other thing we've seen with Donald Trump so far is he's not been able to rack up any meaningful accomplishments with Congress. No major pieces of legislation that have gotten through Congress that he's been able to enact. I did this on the economy. I did this on health care. I did this. Right now, he's not going to have that. And, and if 2018 makes him weaker, 
may not have much to run on in 2020. So can a guy have those numbers and be president and not do much as president in the traditional sense? He's made a lot of noise on other subjects, but in the traditional sense of legislating and get reelected. Again, historically, we're trained to say no, but it's a question I think we're going to, uh, a few years off, a few years off from facing it, but it's a question that's going to get answered. So right now I, I, I kind of see my role and what I'm trying to do here is, is I'm raising questions, I'm raising possibilities. Um, I think it's in some ways, I know right now politics brings out really, really strong feelings in people, whatever side you're on. I'm, I, I, I know that I get that and I, and I think that's a, that's a good thing. But I think from a, a standpoint of just sort of trying to make sense of this and trying to understand it, it's an exciting time too because a lot of assumptions that we've just carried around and we've kind of, you know, mouthed without thinking for years, a lot of those assumptions are now being challenged. Um, and I think it's a moment of humility too for, for people who just, uh, who try to analyze this stuff for a living to say, you know what, 2016 was a sign that we don't necessarily have the handle on this we thought we did. And we've got questions that emerge from it and we want to see how those questions get answered over the next few years and have some better answers um, about what politics <coughs> is really telling us about who and what we are as a country. So I think that's, um, sort of what we're going to learn over the next few years. That's um, the story I'm trying to tell. That's the story I'm, uh, I'm trying to follow. And uh, that's a little bit of how I'm looking at it. And um, with that, maybe we'll, uh, we'll open it up. Questions, comments, thoughts, anything, uh, anything you guys want to talk about? Steve, have you given any thought to trying to analyze what goes through the mind of a Barack Obama voter who votes for this guy? So yeah, that, you may have answered both of them very briefly. A lot of people are just sort of taken aback. This is one of the most, one of the most fascinating stories of 2016 is Donald Trump is not president right now unless a fairly significant number of people um, who voted for Barack Obama twice turn around and vote for Donald Trump in 2016. Um, it's a real phenomenon. Here's an example, Wisconsin. So the, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin are the three Rust Belt states that had been you know, Democratic for the last three decades that kind of out of nowhere flipped to Donald Trump on election day. And so that's sort of the, the real story of the election of why Donald Trump is president. If you really want to narrow it down, it's to those three states. So take Wisconsin. Um, there are 13 counties in Wisconsin that went Barack Obama, 2008, uh, Barack Obama, 2012. Also in 2012, there was a big U.S. Senate race in Wisconsin. It was a very competitive race. They voted for Tammy Baldwin. Tammy Baldwin is one of the most liberal Democrats in the U.S. Senate, maybe the most liberal Democrat in the U.S. Senate. These 13 counties voted Obama 08, Obama 12, Tammy Baldwin 12, and Donald Trump 2016. And so the question is, is, is what is that and why? First of all, I can tell you, where you saw that movement the most um, was in rural areas. It was in rural areas, um, uh, largely white rural areas. Um, you would see swings of 20 points in some cases between 2012 and 2016. Um, there are a lot of theories for what was going on there. I'll tell you, the other thing you saw in those counties too was Bernie Sanders tended to do well. I, I think if you could find a, a parallel, what did Barack, in the big picture, in 2008, what did Barack Obama represent? He represented the biggest expression of change in that Obama versus McCain in 2008, coming off eight years of George W. Bush, eight years of Republican rule, the Iraq war, um, and by the end of the 2008 campaign, the economy was in collapse, he had Republican rule, um, and the Republican nominee was John McCain. He's a Republican. He was one of the most vigorous champions of the Iraq war. Um, Barack Obama, compared to John McCain, I think represented big change uh, in that environment. In 2016, if you apply that same question, who applied more, who, who represented change, a bigger form of change? Well, Hillary Clinton, you, you've never seen a major party presidential candidate who had the level of experience Hillary Clinton had. Um, it's not just the offices she had, I mean, Secretary of State, United States Senate, she was First Lady, but it wasn't just First Lady. As First Lady, she was put in charge of health care. She was, she was doing health care policy. So, I mean, these are, these are major, major 
political roles and, and for 25 years. For 25 years, from 1992, 1991 really, until 2016, Hillary Clinton was not just on the national political stage, she was at the center of the national political stage. And I, I can't think, going back in history, I cannot think of another first-time nominee for a major party, Republican or Democrat. I can't think of an, another first-time nominee who, before becoming the nominee for president, was that familiar of a figure. 25 years in the center of the national political stage, running against a reality show star. And so if, if you're dealing with voters, and I, I think there's a lot of evidence in the exit polls when you look at the attitudes towards the political system, towards Washington, towards the establishment, there's a lot of evidence that the kinds of voters we're talking about here, the Obama, Obama, Trump voters, have a higher level of frustration, disenchantment, whatever you want to call it, um, with Washington and with the political system. If you are looking to blow up the political system, if you're just so frustrated with it, you just want big, you just like the idea of big change, of disruption. Barack Obama would have represented that, and Donald Trump, certainly against Hillary Clinton, would have represented that without getting into specific issues. Because I know when you start looking at the, um, when you start looking at the, the particulars of it, there's not a lot of common ground between Barack Obama's uh, uh, ideology and Donald Trump's, although that might be the other key. <coughs> The types of voters we're talking about, traditional Democratic voters, more blue-collar background, rural areas, Rust Belt. The policy areas where, as a candidate, Donald Trump broke with the Republican Party were on grounds that were friendly to these voters. Infrastructure, he talked about infrastructure, he talked about uh, construction jobs, he talked about blue-collar labor, he talked about government playing a role there. No Republican candidate uh, for president uh, in modern times has talked about that. He had talked about it. He hasn't done that as president, but he talked about it as a candidate. And the second thing he did was, um, again, in a big break from what we saw from Mitt Romney, from John McCain, from Paul Ryan in, in Congress, Donald Trump as a candidate talked about no cuts to Medicare, no cuts to Social Security. So programs that are very important, particularly important to the kinds of voters we're looking at there, Donald Trump told them he's going to protect them. And they hadn't heard that from a Republican before. So that might have... I think that might have entered into it as well. The idea of big disruptive change, but the idea of, hey, you know, keep your hands off my Medicare, Social Security. Donald Trump gave voice to that, and Republicans hadn't before. Sure. Now, so the question that I have is when we analyze, you know, statistics like these that have to do with, you know, Republican sentiment, you know, on Donald Trump, say, temperament, or for example, um, and how only 38 are saying that, you know, he is fit to be president. Uh, we're sort of assuming that, you know, what that shows is that despite that, there had to be a lot more voters, maybe 60% or whatever, that still went out and voted for him. Now, that kind of reminds me of, like, the polls that, you know, we had for, like, the general election. But if you went on to, like, re like real clear politics or whatever, there was really only, like, two polling sites that, um, you know, had, per, like, assumed that he was going to win for the general election. That was, like, Rasmussen and, like, one other. I can't remember. I think it was maybe Fox or something like that. Now, my question is that what if it isn't that these voters are, in these polls, they're saying that, you know, they disagree with Donald Trump, but they're voting for him. What if it isn't just that? What if it, there's a fundamental flaw in the way that we are actually going by the polling, in the methodolog methodology of the polling? Do you think that there's a possibility there? Whereas, like, for some reason, the way that we poll just isn't working in 2017, isn't getting the right demographics. Maybe it has to be more, you know, over the internet. What do you think of that? In terms of what went wrong with the polls, there is, where did I put the other oh, markers over here? In terms of what went wrong with the polls, um, there is one, I think, specific explanation. At least this is the best one I got talking to pollsters after the election. So you got to look at it this way. Um, a particular divide emerged in the electorate on election day last year um, that was bigger than we'd ever seen before um, and it was bigger than anybody had been expecting. And I think it might have, in hindsight, messed up the polls. And you, you heard me, if you watched me on the air at all, um, you heard me talk about this. It, white voters, non-college versus white voters with a college degree. Um, and it's sort of a stand-in for, you know, it's sort of a, a question of social, it's not really about, you know, uh, these are the smart voters, these aren't, it's nothing like that. It's, when you say college, non-college, it's sort of a social class. Um, it, it's sort of a way of, of, of defining social class. Um, 
our country you know, is basically 70% of the electorate, 70% of the people who went out and voted on election day were white. And you could split that group literally down the middle. Half of those voters uh, had college degrees and half of them didn't. And there have been some differences between those two groups in the past, and the differences have been widening a little bit. So um, in 2012, uh, for instance, Mitt Romney. So in 2012, Romney won white voters who had a college degree by 14 points, okay? College-educated white voters went for Mitt Romney over Barack Obama by 14 points in 2012. Now, this group of voters, college-educated white voters, we tend to think of sort of suburbanites, white-collar professionals, that's kind of what we're talking about, you know, right outside, you know, Belmont, Mass, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, since polling began, which is the exit polling began, which is basically 1952, every single presidential election, this group of voters has gone for the Republican. Every single time. It's a question of, you know, margin. Sometimes it's been higher, sometimes it's been lower. But this has always been a Republican group. Mitt Romney won it by 14 points in 2012. Non-college white voters, so this is college, Non-college white voters, Mitt Romney won in 2012 by 26 points. Now, this is a group that's been changing with time. Blue-collar white voters. I was just talking about the folks in Wisconsin, rural counties in Wisconsin. This is, a, this is sort of what we're talking about there. Um, this is a group that historically was Democratic, that's trended more towards the Republican Party, really, in the last generation or so. And Romney was able to win it by 26 points in 2012. Now, here was what was what we assumed, and certainly what the Clinton campaign, I should say, assumed was going to happen uh, in 2012, uh, in 2016. Two things. This group, college-educated white voters, this was what the Clinton campaign pinned its entire strategy on. They believed this group of voters, that Donald Trump offended them at a basic level of, of, of taste, that Donald Trump was distasteful to them with the way he carried himself, the way he talked, the language he used, the types of attacks he used. Donald Trump, they believed, offended their sensibilities, the sensibilities of sort of white-collar suburban professionals, the commuting class, whatever you want to call them. The, and there was polling evidence to suggest this was happening. There was polling evidence to suggest that Hillary Clinton would become or might well become the first Democrat in the history of, uh, you know, uh, Election Day polling to carry this group. And there was a famous quote from uh, Chuck Schumer, who's a top Democrat in the U.S. Senate, a couple weeks before the election. They asked him, you know, state of Pennsylvania, are you worried about Hillary Clinton not carrying the state of Pennsylvania? And the state of Pennsylvania is a great illustration of this kind of divide, because if you get, there's like four suburban counties right outside Philadelphia, ton of voters, ton of college-educated white voters, traditionally Republican, but trending towards the Democrats, and what Chuck, and then the rest of the state, outside Pittsburgh, blue-collar white. Chuck Schumer said, I am not worried about Pennsylvania because every vote we lose in the blue-collar white areas, that part of Pennsylvania, we're going to get two in the suburbs. That's what he believed, so the Democrats believed, so the Clinton campaign believed. They said that's going to be, um, that's going to be what saves us. And meanwhile, they felt with non-college white voters, they said, yeah, we're probably going to lose by the same kind of margin um, you know, that Obama did in 2012. But if those voters were willing to vote for you know, the, the voters who, non-college white voters who were willing to vote for Obama in 2012, if they are willing to vote for a, a black president, they're not going to be unwilling to vote for, for Hillary Clinton. So it's not going to be much worse than, uh, uh, than 26 points with this group. So that was what they thought. What actually happened on election day is, first of all, Trump won college-educated white voters by four points. It's the worst Republicans have done in a long time with that group, but it's a lot better than uh, Democrats thought he was going to do. He won them. Democrats thought they were going to win that group. Trump took them by four. And then non-college whites, blue-collar whites, again, the Clinton campaign theory was can't get much worse than 26. It did. It was 39. Those are the two swings that you saw. So, but take a look at this. When this gets to the question of polling. So this is where, the, this is where I think the polling missed leading up to the election. So where are the states? So it was a 12-point gap between these two groups in 2012. You know, suburban whites and rural whites, if you want to put it that way, were 12 points apart in 2012. Not a, not a huge gap. It's a gap. It's not a huge gap. Now they're 35 points apart. Now it's, it's a gulf. It's expanded. It's a chasm. Okay. Where are the states that this is going to affect, potentially, this kind of gap is going to affect and maybe rejigger the results? It's the states that determine the election. It's Pennsylvania. It's Michigan. It's Wisconsin. It's also Minnesota, which came close. States like that. It's the Rust Belt. 
These are the states with, with a preponderance of non-college white voters who had been voting, if not you know, for the Democrats, not that much against the Democrats, suddenly breaking against the Democrats in huge numbers. So what, this is what one pollster told me that I think made the most sense is, uh, take a state like Wisconsin. We were looking all campaign for signs that Wisconsin was going to be competitive because you could, you could say, hey, if Donald Trump's trying to do big numbers of blue-collar white voters, and we're going to see it in Wisconsin if it's happening. So every time there was a new poll released in Wisconsin in September, October last year, we are looking to see, is this the one that shows a tie race? Is this the one that puts him only a point behind? Is this the one that puts him ahead? Never happened. He was down six. He was down seven. He was down five. He was always down. He was always down the margin you would expect a Republican to be down by. And so Wisconsin was this state that was always on our watch list, Michigan too, Pennsylvania as well, and you never actually saw it in the poll. You never actually saw it happening. And then it happened on election day, and we said, well, how could the polls be that wrong? Here's what I think happened. It used to not really matter in a state like Pennsylvania, Michigan, or Wisconsin whether you were getting white voters from the rural areas or whether you were getting white voters from the suburbs because they didn't, their vote patterns weren't that different. In 2016, it suddenly mattered. And in 2016, they had trouble, and they've probably been having trouble for a while, getting white voters in rural areas, getting folks in rural areas on the phones. So they probably didn't have enough folks from those 13 rural counties in Wisconsin, and they probably had too many from the suburbs. And in the past, no big deal. They're pretty much, they're not the same, but they're close enough. In 2016, that's a problem. And so I think that might have been what happened because the national polling, I don't know, the national polling had Hillary Clinton ahead, she still won the national popular vote. The, the, her margin over Trump in the national popular vote was closer than the polling had been. But the real, the real, you know, shock was those three states. It's a state where, you know, Wisconsin, he's, he's down six points. He's down eight points a week before the election, and he wins on election day. That's huge. That's a bit, you know, in Pennsylvania, Michigan. And, and I, think that's, I think that's what happened. The gap between these groups just became wider than anybody thought and shuffled the math around. Um, Steve, you, um, you're great with statistics, and one of the things that I, there was a um, conference this summer at Tufts University about gerrymandering, and a group of mathematicians did some studies, and one of them came out and talked, um, Mira Bernstein came out and talked at our, my hometown. She was talking about the nature of gerrymandering and different things, and one of my takeaways from that was that um, she talked about the strategy of pack them and, and split them, that when you gerrymander, you're, you're trying to create concentration and, div and division. And when she went through the statistics, it became apparent that Democrats tend to do that to themselves, that urban concentrated areas pack themselves. And so looking at what you were just speaking to, do you think that it's imperative that Democrats do more to reach white rural areas, much more so than doubling down on their base in, in urban centers? congressional districts, for, for state legislative districts, and they, they try to, you know, if the Republicans control the legislature in, in one state, they will try to draw the lines to squeeze as many Republican seats out of it as they can. If the Democrats control, they'll do the same. It, we just happen to live in a world right now where Republicans control a lot more state legislatures than, uh, than Democrats do, and so Republicans, you know, probably get more of an advantage out of that than Democrats, but the, the bigger thing that I think is involved in this gerrymandering question isn't necessarily just how the legislatures choose to draw the lines. It's how we as people choose to live. It's where we choose to live and it's how we relate to our friends and neighbors um, politically. And, and increasingly, it seems, and those numbers I just uh, went through kind of speak to this a little bit, increasingly, culture is syncing up, it seems, with politics. Um, and, you know, red and blue, red for the Republican Party, blue for the Democratic Party, it's not just, you know, well, I, uh, I, I believe government should have this role, so I'm part of the blue tribe, and um, I believe government should have that role, I'm part of the red tribe. It's, 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 uh, it's about choosing a group that you want to associate yourself with, that you want to identify yourself with. A lot of that is what politics is becoming now, and these, these divisions, these demographic divisions that we're seeing um, are becoming deeper and deeper and starker and starker. Um, and that becomes an issue when you talk about um, gerrymandering and you talk about the, the two specific things, the Democrats, three really, the Democrats have to worry about when it comes to this question um, is one that we just saw. 
we don't elect our president by a national popular vote. We elect our president by the Electoral College. And so the candidate who receives 2.7 million more popular votes nationally you know, than, uh, uh, than the other, it doesn't matter unless that candidate wins the Electoral College. We just saw that in action. We saw the same thing in 2000. Al Gore got half a million more votes nationally than George W. Bush. George W. Bush won the electoral votes. So it's happened twice now in the last generation. Um, happens with the House of Representatives. You know, Democrats in 2012, uh, when Obama was reelected, if you just added up every congressional race in the country, the Democratic candidates combined in the congressional races got more votes than the Republican candidates in 2012. But the Republicans won control of the House. And, and it's because, essentially, Democrats live, folks who now identify with the Democratic Party are increasingly in cities, metropolitan areas, and nowhere else. Um, this country has approximately 3,100 counties in it. The entire United States has approximately 3,100 counties. There's a few more, but we'll say 3,100. Hillary Clinton last year, I mean, think about this. She got more votes nationally than Donald Trump. But how many of those 3,100 counties did she carry? About 450. Donald Trump won about 2,700 counties in the country. That's why if you turn on Fox News, they love to show the map of the counties painted red and blue because it looks like Donald Trump won 90% of the vote in this country. Donald Trump won like 80% of the landmass of this country because that's how we now live. Democrats increasingly are bunched in huge numbers in tightly concentrated, densely populated cities, suburbs, metropolitan areas. And so you have like a congressional district, in, you know, New York City is a good example. Um, you got a bunch of congressional districts, like a dozen or more, that either are all in New York City or right around New York City. Well, New York City voted 80% for Hillary Clinton. New York City's got millions of people. So every single one of those congressional districts in New York City there's no real election in the fall. The Democrat, whoever the Democrat is on the ballot is going to get 80% of the vote, 90% of the vote, basically in every single one of those districts. Those are Democrats getting elected to the House. All those Democrats are concentrated there. But then go 50 miles away, 100 miles away, 500 miles away, go across the country, and you've got those much bigger districts geographically where the population, it's Republican. Now, it's not Republican to the same degree. So instead of, you know, you're, you're going to have a lot of districts in Oklahoma, for instance, okay, that's one example, where there are Republican districts. You're not gonna, Republicans are not going to get 90 percent like the Democrat gets in New York City, but the Republicans are going to get 65 percent, 60 percent, 64 percent, whatever. Those are the numbers you're going to see on Election Day. That's still a landslide. That's still a blowout. And the Republican population is just spread out more geographically, um, and it's spread out more efficiently. If, you're just, if you want to just talk in terms of politics, the Republican population in this country is spread out more efficiently. And so you talk about gerrymandering, and, and it's absolutely true that like both parties try to do that, and Republicans have an advantage in doing that now because they control more state governments than Democrats. But I, I, I do think the much bigger issue is how our population is distributed, and how our government reflects that. And I, I just think from a, a practical standpoint, unless Democrats are able to win more than 450 counties in a presidential election, that's a, that's a pretty good barometer, and, and that means you know, that means winning back those kinds of counties in Wisconsin I was just talking about. You know, Barack Obama was able to do it. You know, Barack Obama, 2008, won Indiana. He won a congressional district in Nebraska. Uh, he won North Carolina. He almost won it again in 2012. Um, so I don't necessarily subscribe to the theory that this is such a giant reach for Democrats. They just did it twice, you know, in the last three elections. But they didn't do it in 2016. And I think there's a question of, you know, as I was sort of saying at the beginning, there's a question of what exactly it was about Trump and about Clinton and about the climate of 2016 that led to those defections. But I, I, yeah, I, I have a hard time seeing how Democrats, without winning back those voters, I don't think they can just rely on the base they have right now. I think they're going to run into the same math problem we just saw. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I was a state rep for three terms, and I was first elected in 2006 in one of those wave elections. Uh, something that's always bothered me is turnout. And I would be talking about the factors in the, this presidential election. I'd like to bring up a couple more that I think affected it, was um, especially in Wisconsin, the voter ID problems and the, um, the voter suppression that went on there. They 
reports have been out that the um, turnout was like in the 60 percent rather than in the 70 percent, so that may have been a factor. Um, the media's focus too much on Donald Trump, negatively on Hillary Clinton because of the email scandal, and just total abnegation of any coverage of policy proposals by, um, and then this big unknown factor of the disinformation put out by the, you know, um, the Russians, which built on years of Republican right-wing disinformation, especially about Hillary. Um, I don't think any of those one factors was decisive, but I think the cumulative effect of them does a lot to suppress voter turnout. One anecdote, my son's father-in-law w um, went and, what the hell, I'll vote for Trump, you know, because he didn't want to deal with Hillary, fully expecting Hillary to be elected and woke up the next morning in shock. So I'm wondering how many people did not turn out and vote because they were just turned off by the whole election altogether. And, um, you know, as someone who's followed polls and seen off-year elections, special elections in this state, which now seem to be trending Democratic. But the turnouts in those elections are at 20 and 25 percent. And those are considered high. You know, and the best in our um, presidential election years, we get up into the maybe 70 percent. It's the voters who don't vote who may be the biggest puzzle of all. And whenever someone like John Boehner says, well, the American people have spoken, I always want to say, which ones, the electorate in 2008 or the electorate in 2010? The, um, the turnout question is interesting because there were, there were a couple different turnout stories, I think, in 2016. Um, I'll give you an example. The, the moment on election night when I knew something was up um, because we had all the poll. I mean, you guys know, I don't need to re repeat it. The whole campaign, Hillary Clinton's leading the national polls. She's leading in all the key state polls. All the maps to 270 look like much more likely for her than Trump. We know all of that. At 5 o'clock on election night, we get the, so they're taking the exit polls during the day. At 5 o'clock, the first readout of the exit polls come into the television networks. Um, and we see them at 5, and we are not allowed to say anything on the air about any of them until 7 o'clock. Um, and you can sort of see in our coverage, if, you're, if you watch closely between 5 and 7, you'll, you'll get pretty strong hints of what we're seeing, but we can't actually say it. So um, we go into Election Day expecting it's very likely Hillary Clinton's going to win. It's very likely she's going to win these states. We know where it is. We see the exit polls at 5 o'clock, and the exit polls look exactly like the polls during the campaign did. Um, every state that it looked like Hillary Clinton was winning in October and early November, she was winning in the exit polls at 5 o'clock. So <coughs> 5 to 7 o'clock, I'm getting ready to go on the air and I am still expecting this is going to look a, a, a certain way, the way we've been sort of seeing it in the polls all year. About 8.30, um, they put me on the air. It might have been a little earlier than 8.30. They put me on the air to do um, an update on Florida. So in Florida, there had been a lot of talk about the Democrats organizing the, the early vote. You can vote a couple weeks ahead of time in Florida. It's still unclear how to really measure that ahead of time, but... The exit poll that we saw at 5 o'clock had Clinton ahead in Florida. All the polls before had her ahead in Florida. The reports about early voting were positive for her and negative for him. <coughs> so I go on the air, and there's three counties, uh, My uh, Miami-Dade, Palm Beach, and Broward, three counties in, in uh, southern Florida, southeastern Florida. These are the heart of Democratic Florida. Uh, if Democrats can win these with the right turnout and the right numbers in these counties, you kind of know how the rest of the state is going to go. So this is my test. Having seen the exit polls, having seen everything before Election Day, I want to see how these three are going. And what I saw at that moment, about 8.15 or whenever exactly it was, what I saw was the turnout level in these three core Democratic counties was the same as it was in 2012. And that's what, maybe even a little higher. Um, and that's what the Clinton campaign had been saying they wanted. They wanted the same turnout level. And her share of the vote was at that point slightly higher in those counties than Obama's was. So I said, well, that's, that's it. She's got Florida. She's ahead in the exit poll. She's ahead all campaign, and she's getting the turnout she needs in the places she needs it. That's, we're seeing a Clinton victory. Um, she was ahead at that point in the statewide count by about 110,000 votes. I got off the air, went back to my desk, 
Somebody told me, go back over there and, and check it again. I think something just changed. Go back to the board, 110,000 votes is down to 4,000 votes. You basically lost your lead in the span of a few minutes. What happened? The rural parts of the state, the exurbs, not quite the suburbs, but a step removed from the exurbs, around Daytona Beach, around Jacksonville, um, outside Tampa, and then the rural areas up in the, uh, the Panhandle, they were starting to come in. And what we were seeing there was turnout that was, at, and these are Republican areas, absolutely through the roof, the level beyond anything you could have expected or planned for. If you ask the Trump campaign on Election Day, what is your dream turnout level in these counties, it is higher than that. That's what we're seeing. And we saw that in Florida. We saw that in Pennsylvania. Uh, we saw that across the Rust Belt. We saw, a Republican, we saw an incredibly high level of engagement from Republicans. Um, and not just from Republicans, I should say, a lot of it too, there, were, there was also an element of, of voters who had sat out. There were first time voters. This was particularly true in sort of the northern tier of the country. Um, first time voters who'd been either, who'd never voted before, who'd been inactive uh, for two, three, four elections coming back to vote for Trump. So we saw, it was a strange turnout pattern. Um, you know, you mentioned the, the issues in Wisconsin. I, I think it's, you know, in terms of, w you can never say what won the election or what lost the election. I, I think back to 2000 when Florida came to a couple hundred votes in a Supreme Court ruling. And, you know, you could, so many different, you could blame Nader. You know, Ralph Nader got all these votes Al Gore probably would have got. You could blame Pat Buchanan. Pat Buchanan, there was this confusing ballot and all these people accidentally voted for Pat Buchanan. And if they hadn't, you know, Al Gore would have won the state. You can blame the courts. You can blame the, the, these dangling chads, they call them, these pieces of paper that people didn't punch through. I don't know if anybody remembers any of this. But when it gets that close, you could, you could chalk it up to anything. Um, when I look at Wisconsin, though, with the question of the, of the voter ID law, I do separate that in my mind only because the kind of lower turnout you saw like in Milwaukee, you saw in cities that didn't have, you know, Baltimore. You saw a similar low turnout there. Philly was a bit of an exception. Phil the turnout in Philly was a little higher than people expected, um, which is chalked up a little bit to the final night of the campaign. The entire, you know, Democratic Party plus Bruce Springsteen came into Philly and did their final rally there. It might have, you know, it might have juiced it a little bit. Um, but I'm not sure Oh, and the other thing is the, the, the kind of movement you saw. This was the most interesting thing you could see in the election results. So, you know, what's Florida? Um, well, it's a lot of things, but it's, it, a lot of people retire and move to Florida. And if you're from the Midwest, you move to the Gulf Coast generally. And if you're from the Northeast, you move to the Atlantic Coast. It's a bunch of counties near the Gulf Coast, along the Gulf Coast, with huge, high numbers of Rust Belt expats, folks who came down from Ohio, from Michigan, from Pennsylvania. Um, those counties turned almost identically to how Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, how the Rust Belt turned. So you could almost, you, that was, that to me was the give that it wasn't so specific to something that mechanically happened in Wisconsin or Pennsylvania or Michigan as it, it was how a certain type of voter processed the election. Whether it's that, whether that voter still lives in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, or whether that voter has now moved and retired to the Gulf Coast of Florida, you saw the same movement. So that was the, that was the other thing that jumped out at me. So it, 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 I tend to think, and again, it's, it's never an answerable question when an election's that close. 70,000 votes across three states in an election in which the losing candidate got more than, you know, two and a half million more popular votes than the winning candidate. But um, I tend to think that the, the main explanation for it was something bigger than w a mechanical thing that happened in one state or, or a, you know, a procedural thing that happened in one state, which doesn't mean those issues aren't important. It just means in terms of discerning what, what decided the election. When I saw those Florida counties, I said, geez, I think it was, I think it was something about the type of voter this was resonating with. I think I've taken up too much time. Let's uh, call it off there. But thank you, everybody. That was really fun. Thank you for joining us. All Things Election. Looking forward to two 2018.